Are you curious about the trends reshaping vehicle acquisition for car dealers? Well, if so, we're glad you tuned into this episode. Today, we're sitting down with Tom Gregg, and he's going to discuss the strategic advantages and benefits of acquiring vehicles from private sellers. It's not a brand new concept, but it certainly is one that is still um, not really discussed enough in the industry. So today in this conversation, you're going to discover how dealerships are moving away from traditional auctions and have been now actually for, for several years, how they're enhancing their operational efficiency and significantly improving profit at the same time. So the first place that I want to start, Tom, is around trends. We're always following them in our industry and vehicle acquisition, at least for me, you might correct me because it might have been long before COVID, COVID. But before COVID, I know it was heating up. There was a lot more discussion about it. There was a lot more visibility. But dealers uh, now through COVID and especially where they weren't turning back to some of their core disciplines are seeing this as a priority. Can you share some of your thoughts, insights on what the current trends are regarding sourcing at dealers from um, and away from auctions, private vehicles? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, if you go back to Carvana gaining traction, uh, if you look back to their uh, transcripts for their uh, quarterly earning calls, they refer reference the cars from customers. And that really, I think, set a stage for a lot of dealers seeing that you know, acquiring cars directly from the public is a very viable way. And it's obviously not a new initiative because CarMax has been doing it for a lot longer before Carvana. But I think the duo of, of CarMax and Carvana acquiring cars from the customers really made it clear that there's a very viable uh, option to buy cars as a term of the auction. Uh, it was in 2010 and 2011 is when I stumbled upon this. I was working at a Toyota dealer outside of Chicago and I was a V Auto dealer trying to buy cars in the range that V Auto suggested. And I really struggled at buying cars from the auction that were in that range. Uh, I found myself either uh, overpaying what that range was, which was eroding the profit margin. And I uh, also was buying cars that weren't turning as fast. So I was really struggling to find cars that were low market day supply. So it came down to profitability and fast turning cars that led me uh, to buy cars from the public. And as I did it, I really found the process uh, to be rewarding. Uh, when I when I would get a car, the profit margins were high. However, the process to get there was quite cumbersome. Uh, mm -hmm. I found that I would either not know who I made offers to, I would reach out to a lot of people, and uh, I needed a way to organize the efforts and to automate my, my, uh, my time to be able to reach the sellers that knew what I was doing and just have a conversation. Yeah, you know, just a couple of things you mentioned there. I remember, and actually, I remember learning this uh, from early conversations with you. It's been years ago now, but I was, I was kind of blown away that it was such a core part of the strategy with Carvana and CarMax that they were basically wanting to buy a vehicle from a private seller for everyone they sold. That it was part of their profit strategy. And um, I, I, like I said, I remember in some early conversations with you as, you know, you're definitely a thought leader in this space. I had never paid attention to that. I did some research and reading on that and it uh, it made a lot of sense to me, but it also kind of opened the door to me realizing that I don't think a lot of dealers were thinking that way and um, missing opportunities there. So um, I, I want to move into a little bit of... Um, the fact that I mentioned this before, actually, that you guys are, you've been a pioneer in this category and our industry is full of a lot of niches. S some of them are, <clears throat> are with uh, companies that almost create problems that don't really exist for dealers. But this has been an issue or a, not even so much just the problem, but a huge opportunity for a long time. Curious, you know, how have you guys facilitated the shift for dealers towards acquiring vehicles from private sellers instead of auctions? Yeah, the, we have helped dealers to shift this uh, this effort of buying cars by making it uh, more efficient, so which helps them to save time and make more money. And how we go about doing this is we help the dealers to find their search criteria within their given market. If a dealer was to say they want to buy cars on Craigslist or Facebook or AutoTrader, uh, there's various platforms that they have to go to. Uh, and to stay abreast of all the listings that are coming into market at any given time can be quite challenging and, and a lot of work. 
So what we do is we help them acquire uh, the inventory by aggregating all the classified listings that are within their search criteria. So if a dealer says they want 2015 and newer under 140,000 miles, and perhaps they want to even exclude a few makes, uh, we help them to uh, narrow down all those results into one single place. And then we help them to automate the engagement to some of those sellers. So we currently can text some sellers, but we're also building out additional ways that we can automate uh, the engagement to other platforms as well. Um, in addition to having technology, which is doing the aggregation, doing the engagement and housing it all in one place, we also have coaches that have firsthand experience of buying cars. And uh, a number of our uh, coaches have upwards of a decade of experience of buying cars, and some are still doing it today. So they aren't just practitioners, they're rather not just coaches, they're also uh, practitioners doing the work in the field. Uh, and as they're doing this, they're able to bring those uh, secrets and tips that they are learning firsthand, as well as dealers all across the U.S. and Canada. So by assembling uh, best practices, seeing what is working for some, they can share that with other dealers as well. Hmm. Yeah, all of those. Are, uh, so, <laughs> it, so far, every answer that you're providing just makes lights up some some bulbs here in my brain where I'm thinking about, you know, a dealer who has maybe never considered this before, I would think just the fact that they could build what you're kind of cons saying is like almost a custom template or profile of exactly what they'd be looking for, the criteria that they would want to establish of the things that they want. And then it opens up a market that um, most of them are still not taking advantage of. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a fascinating topic. I want to get into a couple of things that I think a lot of dealers would also, those that haven't uh, ventured into this uh, just yet, they're going to think about, well, what about quality of vehicles? Like, so when it comes to the quality of vehicles, I'm guessing that dealers would, some of them might have concern there. Are there advantages when you're considering these privately sourced vehicles in terms of quality compared to specifically, I think the, the standard model, which would be auction sourced? Well, I think it goes back to, if we first consider what cars are at the auction, you know, typically mm -hmm. a car that makes it to the auction today is either a car that was not a fast mover and an age on a dealer's lot, or perhaps they inspected the car and it needed too much reconditioning and it wasn't worth the investment. Well, those are the only two conditions on why a car may be at the auction, but it is a large reason why some cars may be there, many in fact. And based also on the re the uh, fewer amount of cars that have been produced, we missed about 9 million cars that weren't produced during COVID. So what that means is that there are cars on the road that are older, which the condition uh, may not be up to par what it used to be. So I've heard from a lot of dealers that the condition reports of the cars at the auction are less reliable than they used to be. So if the cars at the auction are potentially rougher than what they were in the past, when we are looking at cars from consumers, uh, people that are in our backyard, uh, they have a story. We have also the opportunity to inspect the car there at the dealership before we buy it. Now, if I buy the car at the auction, I have to pay an extra fee to have the option to arbitrate it. So in order to return that car back to the auction, there's an extra cost for that. If we do this at the store, we don't have to pay anything additional, perhaps outside of having a technician uh, do a brief inspection. But we hold the cards and we also set the tone on the the offer pace. So if we're at the auction, you know, there's a lot of emotions that are flowing. It's exciting at some times. And we may pay up for a car that we wouldn't have otherwise had we had the time to analyze things and make perhaps a better decision. And buying cars from the public, you have the pace to be able to make the offer. If you don't want to make any an offer higher than what you're comfortable, you just stop. Mm. And that doesn't mean that somebody else is going to snatch it up. You have potentially have more time to invest in getting that car. And in addition to that, you have somebody that is a consumer in your backyard, somebody that may purchase a car from you either at that time or down the road. Uh, and so we feel it's a much better route of buying cars from consumers because you get cars that are in better condition and you also have better pacing for your offer. Yep, that that's a, actually a very good segue into this next question that I want to ask. That this year we we're seeing a lot of dealers who are basically getting back to core operational disciplines. Uh, for example, cost management, 
And what you're just talking about right there kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to get some insights from you on. The overall costs, including not just the acquisition, but reconditioning. And you just mentioned it in your, your previous answer. Um, could you could you pro provide a little bit of thought around comparison between vehicles that are bought from private sellers and those acquired at auctions or a little bit more on that and the reconditioning? Because that, that can make a lot of difference for dealers depending on what they know or don't know about a vehicle. And all of a sudden, what you thought was going to be really profitable, all of a sudden, you're upside down on it and you didn't mean to be. So would definitely love to hear, hear a little bit more of your thoughts on that. Well, I would say that the reconditioning would be mostly more accurate, where you're able to inspect the car and so you know a lot more about the vehicle to be able to determine what it's really going to cost you, rather than being surprised uh, afterwards. Uh, and if again we consider the condition reports of cars at the auction being less reliable, typically the cars that people are bringing in, you know, they're trying to compete with retail vehicles from dealerships which mm. typically means that those cars are going to be in better condition than one that may be at the auction because they had uh, too high of reconditioning cost or didn't sell one that was on a dealer's lot. Are there hidden costs that dealers are not, or maybe some of them are familiar with it, but you know, are there costs associated with auction purchases that the dealerships could avoid if they were buying just from private sellers? Because obviously there's there's always been this, well, am I willing to pay all the standard auction fees? But I've heard a lot of people kind of talk about, but there's also these, and you just kind of alluded to it. There are things that can not necessarily be on the surface that, that they come up and all of a sudden when you do pay that final bill, you just aid into another $1,500 of profit or whatever that number is. So are there hidden costs that pop up like that? If so, what, what would some of those be? What would dealers want to be mindful of? I don't hear of hidden costs from our dealers. What I do hear uh, from some of the larger auction houses that the fees, and they start around $350 a month and go up from there. So I'm in for the total after cost to be $1,000 higher than an already high sale price at the auction. So if we consider the, the fee that the auction charges, we consider the, the cost to, and the option to arbitrate that vehicle. We consider the cost to transport it back to the dealership and the time that it takes for it to get there. So those each have a cost. The last one, again, is the time that that vehicle is tied up in transport, where mm -hmm. if it was somebody that brought the vehicle into the dealership, the car is there. They have a chance to inspect it on scene. And there isn't going to be a delay in waiting for it to arrive because it's already on their lot. Is there any human capital cost? Well, there is human capital cost of the person or people that would basically be working the auction or even physically going to auction. Um, is, is that something that dealers should, you know, have any concern over of like, hey, now more than ever, some of your most uh, experienced, maybe talented staff um, depending on your strategy around vehicle acquisition, if they're spending a lot of time on the auction model, is that also an area where dealers might say, is it, that doesn't even make sense anymore when there are so many positive attributes around a private vehicle acquisition strategy? Is it is it fair to say that, hey, the, the people that would work the auction for you, it's better for them to actually be working on your business here than you know to have them spending time at the auction? Or is that... Am I overthinking that? Uh, there, it depends on what the dealer wants. So there, there's typically human capital costs that are involved. Somebody who is working uh, private sellers is often a different skill set than somebody that's buying from the auction. It uh, can be, but we often see it's a different individual. If, if a dealer is really looking to set up a buy center, a buy center has a different human capital cost than somebody that's looking to buy you know, three to five cars from the public. Uh, wants a few cars. Um, we see dealers have success with some of their existing team members. It could be sales staff. It could be uh, the BDC. But for those dealers that are looking to build a full buy center, they're typically going to staff it with a buyer and potentially a manager of that. A successful buy center uh, agent is often somebody that's buying 20 cars or more. Uh, it's not uncommon that we have dealers that have agents that are buying 20 cars a month. 30 cars a month and higher, but the higher you go, obviously the more efficiencies and scale that would need to be in place. 
Mm. Okay, that makes sense. So you mentioned this a couple of minutes ago on like time to market. I was going to ask you, how does that time to get the vehicle ready to be on the lot compare between private and um, auction acquired vehicles? I wonder if you could speak a little bit um, more to that. Are there some other things that happen in that you know time to market? I- I'd love to know, and I'm sure that dealers would would also want to know like could i could i really improve by a day or two or a week like is there uh, any averages around what the differences are between the vehicles that would be auction sourced versus private yeah, i'm not sure what the stats are on that uh sean uh, but if we consider if a car is set up near retail ready as they're trying to compete with what somebody would look at buying a car from a dealership would be uh, that to me would say the car's in cleaner condition and it's going to likely need less time in order to recondition for being frontline ready. The second is just the time to get it there. So when you're inspecting that car to make an offer to buy it, the car is already on their lot. It's right there in house. You don't have to wait for it at all. And we know that people like Dale Pollock are really pushing uh, 30 days rather than stocking 45 days. So a day supply of uh, 30 days for their inventory. So yeah. what that allows them is not having to wait for the car. So if, if a dealer has to wait three or five days or perhaps a week to have the car for the lot, it may take long and increase that time to throw. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the things that I don't hear quite a bit around private party vehicle acquisition is something that dealers do like to have, and that is control and uh, transparency. <laughs> so I'm curious to know, is there... And if so, like what level of transparency and control would a dealership get when they're buying from private sellers versus auction? Is that a thing? And if so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think one aspect would be that they're they're acquiring it from the source. They're acquiring it from the, the owner of the car, which the transparency may be the reconditioning records the service records that the seller had at the time. So to get the story about the vehicle that could be then shared on with the buyer. We knew that we know that those stories have value. And if you're buying the car from the auction, you're one, at least uh, one step removed from getting that information firsthand. Yeah, that makes sense. I hear dealers always wanting more transparency and more control. And I thought, well, um, I don't hear that a lot about vehicle acquisition, but it makes sense. Obvious. I mean, I think the most obvious is that, you know, they're the owner of the vehicles in front of you. So, you know, to your, it's a jackpot if they did keep uh, great service records and they're there in the vehicle. Um, I know that's probably the case for you. That's the case for me. If I brought my Tundra in, they would be like, oh my goodness, we love all this information. But if that ended up at the auction, um, all of that's probably gone. So that's that's a that's a good point. So a couple of minutes ago, I kind of alluded to you know dealers returning to this kind of more of a disciplined um, operations this year. Um, they're not just managing costs really close. They're also looking for all the the best uh, profit opportunities. Paying very close attention to that. Um, wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit on that. Could you potentially elaborate on that? impact from a private party acquisition and its profit margin comparison maybe to auction? Well, if we look back to what dealers were doing prior to COVID, uh, 2019, uh, what we're seeing is things that rebounded back to the way things used to be uh, in really mo- more normal market conditions rather than the huge profits that many dealers were seeing during COVID. Um, when that happens, there is a need to become more efficient, to become more disciplined at the sales process and following up and additionally creative ways on acquiring. So if they're relying on the same ways that may have worked in the past and relying on uh, it to be potentially easy just because the buyer is going to pay whatever the price is, um, I think it's clear that that is no longer the case for most dealers. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about risk. I know if I were a dealer and I hadn't started or hadn't done any at all uh, private seller acquisition, I think I'd be a little bit worried about that. But you've been doing it for so long, so many years. You know, auction, certainly there's a lot going on there and dealers are probably more familiar with risk there. Um, Is there a contrast between the two in terms of private seller and auction around risks? Well, 
When I think of risk, I think more of, you mentioned control. So I think it's more of con control and, and domination, it's dominating your market. So for those dealers that are buying, I think they're more subject to be on, on the on the lower end of what their competitors might be doing. So if you have a dealer down the street that is buying cars from the auction, able to acquire better merchandise, able to buy cars that are selling faster just because it's a more rare vehicle and acquire a potentially lower price and on the lot faster. I mean, these are all competitive uh, components and measures that the other dealers in the market may be doing. So if I was a dealer trying to compete against somebody else that had a better way to source and was paying lower prices, I would be concerned and I would see that there is potentially a risk involved with doing so, or rather in this case, not doing so. That makes sense. Um, if you were thinking long-term strategy, because I think dealers right now, I mean, we are still, um, paying attention closely to this, uh, DMS crisis, cyber attack that has been going on for days, um, uh, unfortunately, um, even before this, this year, dealers are either calibrating or recalibrating strategies across marketing vehicle acquisition, um, and many other dimensions of the business. Um, the market is, once again, highly competitive. I'd love to get your thoughts on long-term strategies that you think dealerships should be adopting that will maximize the benefits of sourcing vehicles from private sellers. I mean, is it a, is it a marathon? Is it a, is it something they should sprint towards? What would you, you know, what would be your, your core recommendations strategically for dealers around this? Well, it's, it is a shift because uh, for a number of factors, one, uh, it can be challenging for dealers to buy from private sellers. So it may take some time to figure out what process works best for that given store and who might be doing it. So uh, if they're interested in creating a full buy center, that re requires people to be involved in executing on the strategy. And in most cases, it takes a while, potentially three months to six months to really get traction to identify what works best uh, for that organization. So when you ask uh, a long-term strategy, this is certainly a long-term play uh, as it's a way to acquire cars that would be more in a sustainable manner to have cars that turn faster and have higher margins. So I would certainly say it's not a, it's not a, it's not a sprint. Um, and it is something that takes a, more of a long-term picture rather than short-term. The other side of that, Sean, though, is when a dealer starts increasing more cars, it isn't limited to, hey, I'm going to run out and buy more cars. There are other aspects that a dealer needs to consider in service drive, right? So if they, if they buy 20% more inventory than they typically do, and that inventory then sits in the service department because they don't have the people or the processes to be able to uh, recondition and process more cars. Uh, so this is why typically ramping up a little bit more gradually and slowly has uh, better long-term implications. Speaking of strategy, do you have dealers or um, have you worked with dealers that from a strategic standpoint, have a preference of setting up so that the consumer comes to the dealership for these evaluations, transaction, acquisition versus a dealership that would offer to go to the private seller and be able to do all of the transaction and acquisition there, or maybe even a hybrid approach. Um, I know when you and I first talked about this years ago, that was one of the things that I didn't get to talk to you enough about that I thought was interesting because you had mentioned that some dealers were doing a little bit of both. But now all the way through COVID and to where now the market's competitive and dealers are really trying to make really good decisions, be a lot more disciplined. Um, do you have any thoughts there on which of those approaches um, are better or the best case scenario if a dealer was going to get into that? But it really depends on the store. We have dealers that do both. And so we have uh, dealers that will be more aggressive to go out and meet the consumer where they're at. Uh, naturally, there's higher costs that are associated with going to the consumer. 
and there are additional processes that need to be considered, such as inspection. If you are going to print the check in advance, how do you handle uh, any adjustments? If the car has damage that wasn't communicated during uh, the phone or the email process. Now, uh, we did see a spike in dealers that were more willing to go to the consumers during COVID. And those dealers typically had uh, favorable outcomes. They bought more cars, uh, which in turn help them to make more money. The, so it really depends on what the store is set up. Do they have the people? Do they have the processes in place to be able to achieve uh, that kind of a strategy? Uh, other stores prefer to consider the efficiency uh, of their team members. How many cars can my limited one, two, or three people buy? And if going to the consumer uh, eats away at time that they would be engaging on the phone, making appointments and making offers, then it may not work out. Uh, it depends on the store. We've seen both. Uh, those that offer to go to the consumers typically buy more, uh, but they typically require more people as well to achieve this. The dealers that will go to the private seller to make this happen, uh, do they give the consumer the choice? Hey, you're, you're welcome to come here to our business and we can do it all here. If you would prefer and it's more convenient, we'll come to you. Is that what they do is let the consumer choose or do they default by, we'll come to you. And then they wait for the consumer to say, well, I'll, we'll just come to the dealership. Or it is, is it kind of all over the place? Typically they're going to press to have the consumer come. And then if there's an objection that they're not willing to, you come to me. So we know private sellers uh, in some cases are a bit reluctant to work with a car dealer. So if going to the car dealer creates some kind of concern or barrier, that it might be a trick to trade the car in or buy something. Uh, yeah. And so if there is that guard there going to the consumer uh, allows that guard to be reduced. And it also allows the, the consumer to perceive that they're in control of the transaction. You mentioned something that I think is probably um, something that maybe dealers are aware of. I'm wondering if you have also something built in your process that you guys do from a van perspective, especially over all the years that you guys have been doing it, but private sellers being reluctant, uh, you know, to work with a dealer or, hey, I'm not trying to sell my car to a dealer. Um, when you guys are onboarding and basically helping dealers get their processes together, um, and you don't have to share them on this particular, during this conversation, but just curious because I think dealers would want to know, do you guys already have best practices around some of the talk tracks or some of the things that are helpful to make somebody more comfortable, to raise their level of trust, to maybe change their perspective uh, from skeptical to, I get it. Is that something that you guys end up having to kind of coach and train a little bit, the dealers, so that they adapt or adopt a new uh, process relative to this type of acquisition? Absolutely. The, the success rate of buying cars from consumers is very different than the success rate of selling cars. So if we look at uh, typical sales, so if a dealer sells a car to a consumer, the, the close rate may be on leads of 12 to 20 percent. So mm -hmm. That close rate on selling contrasting to buying successful buy center, if they're buying between three and 5%, they're winning. So if, if a salesperson goes from selling cars to buying cars, well, that may be a, a third of the conversion, a third to half. So it may feel like the dealer is losing in a scenario when in fact it's, it's a different scope. Buying cars from uh, consumers just is a different uh, overall measurable than selling cars. So we do have uh, best practices. We do coach and train our stores to succeed. Uh, and that's why we have the coaches in place. Because if we were to just sell technology, uh, I don't think our business model would work all that well, which is why we have the coaches. The coaches are in the trenches. They either have past experience or are still doing it today. And they're able to jump in with the store and to help them buy cars. Again, this is, I think, a really good segue into, I've got a couple of things I want to ask you before we conclude this conversation. And this is, uh, again, I think this is a perfect setup because there, there are always challenges, um, always, you know, chasing solutions, trying to figure things out. And I didn't want to forget to ask this and your previous answer sets this up. 
Okay, so you're a dealer. What are what are the main and I love the fact that you guys have coaches. I think that's always really important when you have um a important technology that has some service and process a necessity attached to it, especially when you get into the process and then the absence of, in your case, you guys have coaches, but when you don't have those people, it is very, very frustrating to try to figure it out without it. So question that's relative to your, your last answer is what would some of these main challenges that, uh, that our dealerships are going to face when they shift from say, we're doing most of our purchases at auction to private seller, there are certainly some common challenges that you guys have come up with, the things that coaches probably spend most time on. And you don't have to give me an exhaustive list, but I would love to hear a couple of examples of some of those things that Van helps dealers overcome that, that the dealer would definitely consider to be, well, that's a challenge. This is a new thing for me. What would maybe a, a few of those things uh, be? Well, when we task somebody new to engage with a private seller, many private sellers are not interested in dealing with a dealership. So when they encounter uh, a seller that, that is not very welcoming of a dealer, they can be hostile or aggressive. So if you have a, uh, buyers that are interacting with consumers that are being uh, aggressive towards them, uh, it can feel like they're doing something wrong. Uh, and in fact, just reject the overall process. So we're able to help the uh, the buyers understand that it's just different. Second is that when it comes to activities, we want to be able to track what these agents, these buyers are doing to be able to see if they're set up for success. And by being able to track the activities, we can track how many phone calls, how many texts, how many appointments, how many shows, how many acquisitions to see where in the process is their opportunity for improvement. So for example, if they're making appointments and they have a low show rate, maybe 20 or 30 percent, and we can identify where in the process is uh, the lacking performance, we can then target that area and increase the overall number of purchases. Perhaps they're not engaging with enough sellers. So if the outcome is that they're not buying enough cars, we can see where in the process they may be off. And if it's just engagement, they haven't made enough phone calls or Perhaps they prefer to text. We know that text is not the best form of engagement because when you have a buyer that's engaging on the phone and we can push and encourage the phone calls, we know that those number of acquisitions goes up. When there's something that they're in that can actually convey uh, to the seller, why should we do business with this dealership? And they can talk about the payout process. They can get information. They can affirm that they're local. They're not texting from some other place to try to trick or scam them. Uh, these are all mm -hmm. things that can be achieved over the phone that can't be achieved via text. And we can help the dealer to identify how many phone calls have been made. Or another aspect that we see that typically leads to lack of success is one and done. And for those buyers that are one and done, they're just typically done. You know, one shot, you're not going to buy a lot of cars. So if they're buying a 1% to 2% of engagements and they're not doing follow-up, it's really clear and where the disconnect is. So we're able to coach and train and then show reporting on these activities to illustrate where there is the biggest opportunity for success. I love that. Two last things before uh, we conclude this conversation. One, I wasn't originally planning on mentioning or asking you your thoughts about this, but it has to do with advertising. Um, I think there needs to be a component. And, and this is something that you and I actually did talk about a few years back. Dealers typically miss, and right now there's lots of dealers that miss some of the most lucrative places for them to actually uh, point their, um, their ad budgets. And that is oftentimes in trade-in <laughs> vehicle acquisition, um, where they run a lot of the same, you know, new, buy our new cars, buy our used cars, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy that, but it's oftentimes um, not much thought is put into smart social media campaigns, both organic and paid and paid uh, strategies, perhaps even a good place for remarketing and some display. Would you say, I guess I'll make this easy for you in terms of a short answer. Do you have dealers that incorporate the fact that they are private vehicle acquisition centric 
that incorporate that also into their digital marketing campaigns so that they're actually putting things out there to perhaps soften the customer who would maybe have a bit of an edge that, yeah, you want to buy a car from me. Um, are, are you finding that you have dealers that are doing that? And if so, does it make a difference for them? Do you have any, any thing to share maybe from examples? Uh, yeah, John. Uh, and in fact, a role that I held at the Toyota dealership that I work at uh, was e-commerce director. So I do have some experience in, in marketing in this area directly. And I think the best way for me to answer that question would be to ask you a question. Have you ever gotten uh, a phone call or a text and searched that phone number online to see if that number was associated with anything, maybe a scam or otherwise? I have. And when you found a result that was either affirming what the message related to, to or in the other side was affirming that it was involved in a scam, did you did you act differently on either one of those scenarios? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you, what did you do? Um, well, when I have, because there's so much of this, um, one, I just immediately, uh, once I have confirmation of something being nefarious and just, you know, dismissed. But then I also typically will share that at least with people that are close enough to me to let them know that uh, there's some of this activity that they should be uh, concerned about. So if, if you got a text from a dealer that said that they wanted to buy your car and then you searched for that phone number and you found no results that pointed back to the dealer, might you be a little suspicious? A sub point is if you got a text of that dealer that's interested in buying a car, you search that phone number and it pointed back to the web page that said, we buy cars. Would you treat these scenarios differently? Absolutely. Yeah. If there's no, if, if there's no way for me to posit positively identify somebody as legitimate or hopefully legitimate because the phone number is anonymous, just a number versus something that I can verify. Yeah. Big difference. Some this, credibility, this is, a little bit of yeah. trust building, you know. This is one of the best practices that we deploy and encourage our dealers is we actually provision phone numbers for our stores that we use to send out text messages. So we share that number with the dealership and encourage them to add it to the page. Uh, hopefully they have a page that says we buy cars because uh, if I was a consumer and got a text message, search that store, which consumers do this, they look to see, uh, does this dealership even buy cars you know, from the public? And in fact, if they find that page with that phone number listed because the search results point them back to that page, uh, there's going to be a much better engagement and they're going to be a, a more successful store. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you or do you have any dealers that are uh, incorporating these messages into connected TV, streaming ads, OTT, that world? Anybody doing that that you know of yet? Uh, that does not ring a bell. I don't recall of any dealers of ours that are doing it. It might not be that they're not more of just, they haven't shared that with us, yeah. but we do that the dealers are putting campaigns. So the, the more cars that they need, uh, often has the bigger budget and applying it to marketing efforts, web page, search results and, uh, other efforts as well. Yeah. Yep. That's what I would think. And that's certainly if I were, you know, giving unbiased advice to a dealer that wanted to go in this direction, I would tell them that it absolutely needs to be a new pillar within um, your your marketing and your advertising um, efforts, because I think it probably makes a very significant difference compared to dealers that do nothing. Even if you're doing this, but you don't do anything from your um, marketing strategy perspective. Last thing I want to ask you, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up on an, on another conversation is just uh, when you think about the future, your crystal ball, uh, and this doesn't have to be like 10 years in the future, but from where you started to where we are today, what's a little bit of kind of what you see in the future of, of vehicle acquisition across the industry? Um, very curious to know because you're one of the foremost uh, experts, if not the top thought leader in this category in our industry. Where is it going? What do you see? What would you like to see? What would you encourage dealers to be thinking about that's going to be coming up this year, next year, five years? 
Well, thanks, Sean. Yeah, we have been doing this quite some time, uh, 11 years and counting. Uh, what I imagine is the, the strong will get stronger, I believe. So the dealers that are taking this serious uh, are going to continue to, to drill into it. We saw during COVID there was an uptick in dealers that were buying cars from the consumers. Uh, I don't recall the exact number, but I believe it over doubled the percentage. And that was an NADA study that looked at franchise dealers that were and where they sourced their used cars. Um, and that number, uh, I believe, it was around double in um, 2021 compared to 2020. Uh, and the number in 23 went up, it, rather it went down. So there were fewer dealers that were buying cars uh, directly from the public. So what that tells me is that some dealers tried it and found that it was quite challenging to go at it on their own. And perhaps they didn't have our support to be able to uh, to connect and, and learn their ways and, and, uh, and, and find their path. Um, so I believe that those that are, are drilling into it and, uh, and had success, they're going to continue to get stronger and better with more efficiencies. That makes all the sense in the world. Listen, Tom, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate this conversation. I look forward to doing this again. Uh, I really look forward to follow-up conversations to get a little bit more into some of these details that I think will help dealers as they go through, you know, it's a kind of a formative year where people are really, like we've mentioned in this conversation, kind of getting back to some of these fundamentals, more disciplined. And, uh, you know, it, the timing is still really, really, really um, hard to argue that it's not ideal to actually incorporate this type of strategy for vehicle acquisition um, sooner rather than later. So thanks for taking the time and I look forward to our next conversation. Great. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.